Camera is rolling. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Talks from the Moon. And today I am blessed to have two people Francois René Rideau, aka Fare. You guys know him, of course. And our guest, our special guest today, is Mr. Gilad Bracha. Nice to have you here, Gilad. How are you? Thank you. Very good to be here. So, first question for our audience to know a bit who, who you are. Can you introduce yourself in a few words? Right. So, um, I've been, I'm a programming language person, I guess, is the, the core relevant thing here. I've been working in this area for uh, an embarrassingly long time, uh, since I did my PhD in the uh, early 90s, late 80s on programming languages, on, especially on inheritance and so forth. Um, then I joined a startup that did some interesting work on uh, small talk, a high performance small talk virtual machine and a small talk type system that I was involved with. That's relevant because it got acquired by Sun and became the Java hotspot virtual machine. And then, uh, then I uh, spent about 10 years uh, caring and feeding for the Java language specification and the Java, at some point, the Java VM specification. Um, I am largely to blame for, for many things there. Um, and uh, then uh, after that, I uh, left and did the work I'm most proud of, the, which is on a language that is not well known called Newspeak, which is um, in the Smalltalk family, but has much stronger concepts of modularity and, and so forth. Uh, since then, uh, let's see, I spent some time at Google, six years. I was involved in Dart. And uh, after that, I've been at uh, various startups doing various things. And currently, I am a technical fellow at F5, which is a company that does uh, security software and networking and also networking hardware. I think that uh, that should be a, a pretty good overview, I hope. Yes, so one of my first questions would be, what is modularity? Like you worked on it, like your thesis was on modularity. You say you're interested in modularity and you speak, especially. What is modularity? Oh boy, a definition, eh? That's, uh, that's uh, not, uh, not easy to improvise because, um, but, but again, I think there are different views on this. In fact, sometimes contradictory views. My view is, modularity means that something can be you know basically designed built in the context of software compiled whatever uh independent of of anything else uh that it can be taken as a separable thing and uh and only at some final stage when you need to to actually run something or build something if we take more broadly modularity as it is in in hardware which is really the inspiration for the model that i'm looking at then then it's 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 a module right it can exist completely independently it can be built and designed completely independently of anything else okay uh, i i I, I think that uh, well, there's a completely independent. There's still the notion of interface, I suppose, that you need to to, to deal with because you have something. Right. So, so you can, when you define a module, you can decide what interface you think you'll use and what interface you'll need. But that interface is something that you are working with. But 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 you don't need anything that actually implements that inter that external interface that you are using. You do not need to have on hand something that realizes the interfaces on the other side that you are going to connect to. Okay, so uh, is a Java modular language because it has interfaces, for instance, or how, <laughs> how is, how is this improving on that? Or how is Java failing that? So after, after, after the, the hard question, you saw the, the softball very well. <laughs> uh, Java is not remotely modular in any shape oh. or form. And, um, Interfaces are, if if Java, a language that is really built, takes the the notion of interfaces seriously, uh, well, it may well is is well on its way to being modular, depending on all, perhaps on some details. Uh, and if Java only had interfaces, uh, perhaps it would be modular. But Java, of course, 
interfaces are, are, are almost an afterthought there. And uh, there's many things that, that don't work this way. And uh, the interfaces don't apply to everything. They don't apply to things like packages, right? Once you have second class notions like that, you know, you're, you're likely to be in trouble anyway. Um, regular classes, of course, can, can be used as types. And so they, you know, you're not bound to use interfaces. Uh, there are many, many reasons why Java doesn't uh, uphold this concept, right? You have imports, right? The root of all evil. You can, you, what is an import? An import is, is saying that I'm pretending that I have a module, but I'm actually telling you that I'm connected to some other specific module. Uh, the, the thing I like to, to uh, give example in my, in my talks, imports are like um, a modular, uh, take your computer, your laptop. You can disconnect it from everything and it'll even work. Um, but, you know, and in that sense, it is quite a modular thing. Uh, once you plug it into the power grid, you have the an, an analogy of an import. An import is saying, you can take this wherever you want, as long as you take this cable, uh, pull on it, it'll go through the ground, you'll pull it out. Eventually at the other end, a nuclear power plant will come out and you can carry that with you. And that's, that's how modular imports are, right? The, the point is, can you actually do this without that connection? And uh, imports cannot. Imports declare that you are tied to a specific thing that you expect to, to have. And, and that is why they are saying the common modularity constructs across many, many languages are, are hopelessly broken. So, so to contrast uh, what I think you mean, uh, for instance, um, in Java, you have to declare in advance that the class process an interface. You can't like fit the class into inter the interface after the fact, but you, it looks like you want something just more than fitting the, the, the class in interface. You want to be able to uh, do it at, at runtime or, or while, or maybe even while the program runs, or is it just statically before the program runs, or how do you want to be able to do your rerouting of interfaces? So, uh, so I think that the fact that it's much more than the interface, right? Declaring that a class supports an interface is really just a typing dif discipline. That's a static thing that, uh, you know, well, we could get into my views on optional typing and so forth, but the, the fact is you could declare the class and build it and, and, uh, and then you're basically just statically checking that it conforms to an interface, right? That, that is a static checker, which you can do. And uh, that's all fine. The, the real problem with, with the modularity is that you cannot actually get anything done without linking to a million things that have to be specified, right? You have to import, some things are imported automatically, uh, you know, depending java.lang or, or things like that, right? You cannot, and you, and you cannot substitute another thing for them, right? You cannot have multiple alternate implementations of java.lang because the whole interface notion doesn't apply at that level. There are no interfaces for entire packages, right? Because packages are a separate kind of beast, a, a, a second class thing that, that, that is not a value that you can handle. So this is also a problem. I mean, it's not essential, but it typically is a problem when you have multiple levels of, of something that could be covered by the same concept, right? It's, uh, you know, you have classes, you have packages, uh, then there are people who do the feature oriented programming because these things right where where you want to combine multiple packages there there have been people who seriously have written papers and so forth about how you do this with a new thing called a feature and and the point is that it's uh at every level you introduce a new concept for for what is basically a recursion on the same thing and and it has its own rules and its own limitations and its own tools and it just is a lot of work and I, you get more work and less results so so in in you speak you have recursive uh, package uh, module of what you call modules and interfaces or classes and essentially, what... essentially we leverage one concept which is the class okay uh, and classes can nest and not like they nest in java because that is that is a, a, a train wreck we could discuss but that is a separate problem uh they they really nest so so you can have multiple classes uh, within a class. Classes are essentially members of, of other classes. 
and uh, and you can do this to any degree so if you have say a collections library uh, you have a bunch of things like lists and maps and, and the typical collection things and they are members of a collections class that's essentially gives you the complete library and that class can for example be uh, instantiated multiple times it can be stored it can be serialized it can be passed as a as a parameter and therefore you can write code that uses the collections interface and it can be used with multiple different collections modules different instances of that module or a different a different implementation that conforms to the same interface will work just as well that's the real point of of modularity is that again it, it this thing uh, you, you write something that wants to use collections, and it can be defined completely independently of whether collections even exist. And anything that matches collections, that works like a collection, will work. And you can swap them, yes, and you can even swap them at runtime. So uh, that, that the concept of interface is actually very central here, because that is that is the real heart of, of what object-oriented programming is, not classes, not inheritance, um, certainly not the, the java-like things interface is 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 what it's really about and um, a language that doesn't make that central and yet claims to be object-oriented like most of the mainstream whether it's java or c sharp or c plus plus or any of the others is basically missing the point and giving object orientation a bad name so, so how does that compare say to uh, modules in ML or who claim to also have this notion of interface and that you can uh, implement many ways. So how does that compare to modules? So, so ML is interesting because yes, there is a similarity uh, in the sense that you have in ML, you have these things uh, called structures and they have signatures, which are the interfaces of these structures. And they these structures can be parametric, uh, in, and then they're uh, called functors. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of names here for things because uh, because what w the, the the problem in ML is that uh, there is this leveling problem that at different levels, right? So so you could have a record or you could have a function, but a function cannot take structures as parameters. Uh, um, Modules are, are essentially at a different level, and that was done for for type type reasons, basically to to uh, handle the fact that they wanted types to be part of their modules and and to avoid type type and all kinds of of nasty things like that. They they basically stratified the system, which in my view is is a mistake because now you 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 basically recreate the shadow world of of the same notion you had uh, functions would be enough for everything there the lambda calculus can handle everything you ever needed and there was no need to invent this whole extra level of structure because if you had functions and you had records then you could pass and you could the records could have function members and they could have also members that were collections of functions and they could recurse and it would look suspiciously like interfaces and objects of course and and you you would be done now instead in ml you have these functors and there are limitations on them they cannot have recursion because it'll be undecidable uh and all real modules of course are, are almost always arrangements of modules are mutually recursive so how are you going to set them up if you have that limitation all right so they cannot recurse they are not first class uh therefore you cannot also build higher order things you cannot have a functor that takes a functor right now each of these has independently been researched uh, as as a topic of research, of, there are papers on making functors that that are higher order. There are papers on 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 uh, you know mutual re recursion. Uh, there are even attempts to combine them. They're brilliant. They're enormously complicated. They they exhaust the Greek language in all its forms, uh, but they never hit the mainstream because it's you know it's too complicated. Uh, and I think the, the root of that failure is the stratification, which instead of having, you know, just leveraging the structure that's already there in the language, uh, instead you, you basically let the, the types uh, restrict, force you into, into decisions that, that make things uh, fail. To a point, OCaml, I, I think, I, I, I don't think they have quite perfect solutions, but they do try to address, they have the ADTs and existential types and first class module. I mean, they say 
in OCaml, the same module of structures, but uh, the same, essentially the same thing. Uh, and this has all those things. Uh, and in my experience, what uh, a big things they miss, uh, apart from their type restrictions, is also the, the lack of inheritance, but uh, which means it's sometimes very awkward or open recursion. There's, yes, there's lack of open recursion or, or inheritance that, that means that you can't um, have you can't have proper mixings or proper um, specialization of behavior. You have to to plug the whole behavior at, at the last minute or something like that. Uh, yes, OCaml well, well, actually is is yeah is actually quite capable, um, and uh, they they actually sort of abandon the the restrictions of uh, standard ML and have uh, you know basically. In essentially the right structure more or less yeah they don't have inheritance which is not essential uh you know inheritance is a very useful mechanism it is not essential uh you know again you there's another view of modularity which was sort of pushed in i pushed in my phd thesis that, that relied heavily on 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 viewing inheritance as a modularity mechanism which is in fact it's a double-edged sword there are both things pro and anti-modular about inheritance but um uh, you know that's that's sort of a separate view but in terms of, of ability the ability to have uh, modules and, and and compose them and stuff in, in ocaml is pretty good now uh the type system and all it just complicates things enormously when you when you insist on all that kind of uh legacy of hindley milner and and everything that it it becomes mind-bogglingly complex but at least they do have a yeah i do they, they do have a working system that's probably better than uh, almost anything else, uh, barring you speak, of course, but uh, I might be a little biased there, but I, I do believe that. So you say something interesting, that inheritance can be both uh, modular or anti-modular. What is modular, what is anti-modular about inheritance? So uh, let's start with, uh, with um, why it's good for modularity, right? It, it lets you, again, it's a it's a it's a powerful reuse mechanism. It's a mechanism where you do not have to repeat or copy or recreate something. You can take a, an existing structure and reuse it in a certain way without uh, having to to repeat the entire thing. Right? It's a it's a different mechanism compared to conventional sort of parameter passing, which is actually what what is used in, in ML functors, which is what is used in OCaml, and is what is actually used in, in Newspeak most of the time, right? Uh, so, so that's a, a useful way for where you can basically, because because what one of the purposes, so there is what is modularity and there's what is its purpose. And its purpose is to be able to use something again and again in, in different contexts, right? Without having to redo it from, from scratch, right, to, to, to reusable parts, if you will. And in that sense, uh, inheritance helps. Uh, but there are inherently things about inheritance where you cannot get this property that you are, you are insensitive to, to changes and to, to de you know, developments, because in inheritance, you are, you are getting very closely intertwined with, with the module you're inheriting from. And as a result, you can you have all these problems that, that things that you change there that might you might deem to be internal are in fact impacting these these things that are using your module, right? Uh, uh, essentially, you have a more complex notion of interface where where the internals play a role as well, and in that sense, it's it's problematic. Yes, but the fact that you're affected by some modules is uh, anytime you import a module you will be affected by changes in modules of import so uh, i so yes there is a mixing of internal and external that is interesting but the fact that you depend on modules is i don't think is a contradiction with well the, the fact that you depend on, the fact that, you know you can implement a module and the idea the common idea is as long as it obeys this interface not only syntactically but say semantically right as, a, as long as this thing behaves the same its internal plumbing could be totally different right now what inheritance does is expose much of that internal plumbing and so your interface is now much uh 
wider and therefore you're you're sensitive to many many more things uh that uh and you, you you have a hard time separating them you can have a notion of private things that aren't inherited uh, but then you you lose the the advantage right there they're just uh not there but anything that is uh is part of that mechanism that is inherited so that you can reuse it and modify it means that everyone is now sensitive to to any implementation change in in that substructure whether they they cared about it or not so it becomes in practice much harder to to be sure of of, of uh, the fact that you're immune to, to changes in that original module. So speaking of things that can or cannot be inherited, uh, C++ has some visibility mechanisms for its fields and member and friend classes, etc. Java has something that's broadly similar but subtly different in many ways. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I mean invaded by a little girl. Uh, mm. Uh, uh, and uh, what what is Newspeak's answer to all these values as subtly incompatible? So and these distinctions of um, a lot of these languages, they make the distinctions along the kinds of members, like they're distinguishing executable code uh, from storage, mainly. And um, and in some cases, they yeah, you mix in type declarations, so you have nested. Uh, so basically, in Java, type there are three namespaces that are uh, different. Right, and they each have their own rules, which are not particularly coherent. Uh, and uh, that is not uh, the division you want, because again, uh, what I believe generally in, pro in design, especially programming language design, there's enormous leverage from from uniformity, from having a small number of components that follow that compose, right, that follow the same rules, and again, recurse, and and you can. This is a whole notion of language, right? What makes language uh, language is interesting is exactly this kind of composition. You have a, a small set of rules of grammar rules and they span an infinite set of sentences that, that are all the programs that you might ever want. And, uh, this is, this is something you lose when you start to having these arbitrary divisions, right? So in Newspeak, uh, there basically is the idea that, uh, the members of, a class are every everything is a message then and everything is therefore uh, dynamically bound and whether it's realized by a field or a nested class or a method is really an implementation detail so if i refer to foo and foo is a field that stores a class or foo is a definition of a class or foo is a unary method that returns a class i will not be the wiser right uh, I shouldn't care about any of that. That also means that if I decide to change the representation of of something and say, you know, I'm not going to use these store these things anymore. I'm going to compute some of them and store something else. And I can make that change without breaking anyone who's using it because they don't know. They're always sending messages. They don't really know if those messages are implemented one way or the other. And, and that's, uh, so this representation independence is a, an important property, right? So that you can uh, essentially be, in, so you only depend on the interface in a very strong sense that the interface is what operations you can ask this thing to do. So we're looking at the Newspeak environment, which runs in the web browser. And um, it's it's basically a an ID running in your browser locally. So this is not something that's, uh, going back to a server and and having these discussions back and forth you know i could unplug the internet now of course i, I wouldn't be able to talk to you but the, but this thing would continue running in its tab uh, quite happily and uh then uh, we can look at some some class let's see what is a good example um here so we we were talking about collections right so this gives you a structured view of the code and we have a class it's called collections for primordial soup it's a particular implementation of collections that is used for for this web-based system and uh, in it are nested classes list map ordered map ordered set set things that you might expect in a collections library so this this class collections for primordial soup is really uh acting as a as a library 
and um, we can view this is this is the class header, the actual source for the class header. So you have class keyword, you have a name, and uh, what's going on here perhaps is worth explaining. There are these are fields, slots as we call them, and uh, we have two slots. Uh, for uh, which are basically acting as the analog of imports. So there's no import uh, construct in in Uspeak. Instead, uh, the way you import things is uh, you basically take the parameters to your factory method, which is the analog of a constructor. And that is your only connection to the outside world because a Uspeak top level class doesn't refer to a global scope. There is no standard Trello. There is none of these things that most languages lean on, which is essentially some, some predefined set. There's, there's one cheat that they all inherit from object. So there are things that, that they get magically through inheritance from, from object. Uh, but other than that, they have no connection to the outside world except what is passed in as a parameter. In this case, this thing IK, which stands for internal kernel, uh, is the only parameter that it's getting. So that means that these things are inherently sandboxed. They have no connection, as I said, to the internal world. There's certainly not, they have no connection to the external world uh, and especially to anything effectful. So from they do inherit from object, but then the object they think they inherit things like uh, the classes for numbers or for strings things that are essentially stateless objects, right? There is no, they cannot influence the inter external world in any way. So they, for example, there is no thing like native in Java where you can call a foreign function and do things just because it's a language feature. You will have to get, you know, if you want a, a foreign function, something that can do access a foreign function will have to be passed into you. Uh, this is the key thing. Everything is, has to be passed into you. So the external environment controls what you can do and not the other way around. Uh, this so, this, uh, this reminds me of the W7 article you may have read long ago by Jonas Andres about uh, scoping as a capability mechanism and security mechanism. And, uh, yes. Yeah, it is, a, it is a capability mechanism. This is a uh, new speak is an object capability language. Uh, interestingly, this was not the original intent. Uh, the original intent was simply to be modular. And then uh, the, the moment we, we made it modular, we realized, oh, it's a sandbox and it'll do security as well. So yeah, it is an object capability language and, and the capabilities are passed in here. So this is the only you know, thing that, that can give it the ability to do anything, whether it's, and this includes anything like writing to the file system or networking, all the standards examples of, of powerful capability that, that people are worried about from a security perspective. It also can things like native functions, right? You can't you can't uh, call that because that's another thing that languages you know once you call C all bits are off anyway. So what's the point of of trying to to secure that? So this is one property. Now then the question arises: Okay, then how do you in fact uh, get anything done? Uh, you can't define the whole world inside your, your top-level class. So a top-level class is the notion of a module. It, is, it can be compiled completely independently. Uh, you know, the per, at, at when you're compiling, this thing doesn't exist. It's just a name, and you can compile this thing, and therefore you can load things and compile them in any order. You don't have, in, in, in that sense, you don't have actual external dependencies at compile time, right? So that's, that's part of the story. Now, how do you get at things? Well, given this capability IK, you, this is an object that you can send messages to and it can give you things. So it is a capability. Uh, the only things this thing needs, uh, the, for various uh, organizational reasons, the root collection class is in the kernel module. So you get that so that you can inherit all your other co collection classes can inherit, inherit from that. And it wants to, to have an error class that also comes in from there. And so you can look at this module and know for a fact that it does not access anything in the outside world. It does not do anything strange and cannot do anything strange, un you know, unless you, you know, you, you pass it something that uh, where a collection can, you know, is actually a poison pill of some and, and doesn't do what you expect a collection to do. But 
it's controlled from the outside. So you can trust it. If you are passing it something that you, you are comfortable passing it, you know it will not do something underhanded uh, behind the scenes. And these things are essentially imports, right? Now, once you've assigned this value to the field collection, uh, we now have, that's as if we imported the class collection, except that we haven't committed to any collection in particular or and we don't need it to exist when we compile and we can mock we can mock it for tests with something else we can give it different implementations we have all these nice properties that we generally identify with good modularity and they they're here for free so so this is kind of um, the basics of how you organize new speak programs by composing these top level classes i'm not sure if i answered the question but there you go so if all the classes are scoped and private, you don't actually see all the classes. You see all the classes that have been registered within this scope or something. Yes, yes. So so this thing, well, first of all, as I said, as a top-level module, you see no classes, right? There are the classes you defined, and you are assuming that someone will pass you some object, IK, that will respond to a message collection and give you something that will function as a superclass for these things. And whether it realizes collection by computing a collection on the fly or storing one or defining one is, is none of your business. Now, more generally, there's the question, okay, how do I build these things? How do I compose these things given that the language doesn't really have a global scope or prelude? And that is... Um, what this is for. So the IDE is just a program, right? A new speak program. And it uh, it maintains a namespace, right? You do need some sort of namespace of all the components you're going to use, and then, then you'll be able to reference them and, and compose them in some way. Uh, it's up to you to load things into this uh, namespace. Now, every language plays this trick in some usually fairly perverted way. So uh, if you go back to things like uh, Modula or whatever, Right, there are imports, and there's this assumption that, you know, the, the the modules you are naming, there is a convention that they should be in the file system. Basically, that, ty that typically you lean on the file system as your, as the real universal namespace, right? Uh, and that that is sort of defined extra linguistically. It's not part of your language. Won't you won't be able to do anything useful with your language without it? But it's not actually part of the language definition per se, right? There is usually says, yes, imports are resolved by some mechanism outside the specification, which is almost always the file system. Uh, things like Java, there's class path and all these things, they're similar. They're just tricks to, to lean on a namespace provided by the file system, right? And then some set of conventions as to which directories you'll look in and which order and all this, and it gets worse and worse and more complicated and brittle as you go along. So the idea in Newspeak is typically in the small talk tradition, we're going to let the IDE do this for us. So it will contain all these classes. And then the IDE has a, has a, can re, it will let you refer to the namespaces. So if we look here at, um, if we have a workspace. Now here I can refer to uh, collections, I think for crime or deal. Let's see if I have not misspelled this, then I can uh, validate that. And yeah, it found something. So it knows about this namespace. And, and there's a, a, a sort of cheap reflective trick how this is implemented. Basically, the workspace classes have a do not understand method that goes to the IDE's namespace and looks things up there. And so it gives you a, effectively a, a place where you can evaluate things and refer to all the top level names. And therefore, you can then compose something if you want. So, so I would like to briefly go back to, to what you said about the fact that in all these other languages, besides probably small talk and you speak of some of the very few exceptions, there's a lot of the semantic that is actually acts outside the language. You depend yeah. on even the make tools, the compiler. You suppose that there's something outside the language that has all these conventions about pass. Uh, uh, about shells, and actually, the semantics of C is not the semantics. It's not the semantics that matter. It's the semantics of C plus all the C environment. The semantics of Java plus all the Java environment. The semantics of whatever. But 
you have to pull in all those things. So it's all the semantics of C is very simple. The C fits in a few hundred pages. Yes, no, but semantics of C is like with the 300 pages plus the tens of thousands of pages of main pages that go with it. Whereas in, in small talk and in new speak, you, you, the semantics is concretely in the compiler and the environment. And I remember that um, Alan K was trying to make a small talk environment and, and did that, that's it in, in 10,000 lines of code. He had the compiler and the environment, etc., and it all fit together. Uh, suppose Newspeak is similar. How, how big is Newspeak? Uh, how big is Newspeak? Uh, so, you know, I think I'm trying to think of, you know, because we we have the ID now. If the ID is, if, if you count that, which is important, even though it's not part of the language, but it, it does, in, in practice, it serves that purpose. So I don't know uh, what we'd have, some some tens of thousands, because uh, again, there's all the libraries, right, which is important, and that's true of every language. And so, and we don't, one of the reasons it's small is we don't have as much libraries as we should have, right? It, it's sort of endless. But I don't know, 60,000, uh, somewhere between 60 and uh, there are probably 100,000 lines of Newspeak line of code that were ever written, and some of them are redundant and old and whatever. So. I'm guessing I, I haven't counted this in a while, but on that order. That's too re remarkable. I mean, 60,000. I, I don't know even if make itself is, is less than 60,000 lines of code, or not to speak with the shell and etc. So you have you have an entire language and environment in the space that Unix people have just one single utility that is totally useless by itself. Uh, well, it's it's in the nature of these things that they grow, and and the more irregular they are. I mean, Unix actually, at its root, had a had a brilliantly uniform idea, but over time, this just diverges, and things become more and more complicated and and irregular. And of course, there's a lot of functionality there. No question, we we are lacking enormous amounts of functionality, so so things would be a lot bigger. Um, but um, we are trying to be as as kind of coherent as we can. So we don't because when if you don't do that, everything multiplies very quickly, right? You have Java has different, literally different rules for its three namespaces for the types and the fields and the methods. And each one of those, you know, you have different rules. They have to be resolved. Things just um, everything becomes much more expensive to implement because there's just so much work to account for all these special cases and their interactions. So it, the, the power, as I said, of language is that you have this small set of rules that, that are combinatorical, right? They're combinators really, and they, they feed on each other. Uh, if you do it wrong, what, what expands is not the power, but the interactions, the complications, the surprises, right? They interact in so many, in an unbounded set of unforeseen ways. That's what happens in in sort of the mainstream, the, the big languages where there's too many features. Uh, part of it is historical expediency, various reasons why this happens. But this is this is what one wants to fight against. This is, you, you remind me of other things that I've worked in the past. So I've worked on on the kind of modularity system for common long ago, like what's called ASDF. And my first paper on ASDF was subtitled more cooperation, less coordination. And I feel that this is maybe some of the essence of what we are trying to approach with modularity, where we want uh, people to be able to cooperate with each other and modules to be able to maximally be useful with as little overhead and repetition and uh, I don't know, re redundant and boilerplate as possible. And yeah. it looks like you have a good answer to that where uh, we're trying i mean this is always a design in every in every time when you have a particular semantics you have you have this challenge again and it's hard in every case because how how well do you understand the domain because making things simple is hard right it's it's very people are impressed by complexity generally because you know managing complexity is hard and when someone shows you something complex, you tend to think, oh, how clever this person is for having been able to figure this out and make all these persons work together. And they are very clever. Uh, what would be even better than being clever would having enough insight to reduce this to a small number of, of core things, which is actually way, way harder. But if you, if you show people that, they won't even, 
most people won't even realize that this was harder and, and required more than, than making a complicated solution because uh, people really don't understand, uh, you know, mis van der Rohe, uh, less is more, right? This, this is uh, a, a paradox that, that goes over most people's heads. So it is very hard to make things simple. And so in every new design, you'll find that you probably didn't make it simple enough the first time and, and you have to, to keep at it. You, 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 what you just also remind me of the notion of three star programmer, or in this because I'm three comma programmer, I don't know if you know the notion. Uh, a Which, three star programmer in, in, in the C programming language, when you have a star, you it's a pointer interaction. And oh. the three star programmer is a, a programmer who, in whose code, sometimes there are three stars aligned. So it would, he, this programmer can manage very complex code that do things like normal people can't do more than maybe two in directions in their head and then. To get yeah, yeah. There, people are amazing at it. There's no question that that that, and that's a useful skill in a lot of situations when when the complexity is already there or you don't have the the time to, you know. It's, it's there's a, the similar thing about writing, right? Uh, I forget who from who the quote is, but uh, I I'm writing you a long letter because I don't have time to write a short one, right? That's a similar process. That it is boiling things down is is much harder. Pascal Faber still wrote that uh, a programming language was named after him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, okay. So, so that's the, he's he's the originator of that. So, because it's been, it's one of those quotes I think that is ascribed to multiple people. Uh, over over time, people people uh, miss miss uh, uh, ascribe it to to various people. But the the idea of simplicity and and the idea of composition is is really really important, right? So combinators. So this, I mean, this is the root of algebra right, is the idea that you have this space and there's a small number of operators on this value of, of uniform space of values and they take values in this space and produce new values in this space. So it's a closed set and, and therefore spans the, the space, right? And that, that's the root of, of all algebra and, and combinators and this is what we, we should strive for. So, uh... What do you think then of category theory people who try to to go to the root of these combinators and things? Well, that's a fine, you know, that's a fine mathematical activity. Um, I think that uh, in program programming languages, certainly a large part of the academic community has a bit of a fetish with these things, uh, and they. Uh, they love them for their own sake and they and then try to to appropriate them to their to to language work whether or not it really matters or works or simplifies and uh, that's just a, that's a subjective judgment which is no doubt controversial but uh, yeah i haven't seen a whole lot of you know the application of category theory is uh, has been, you know, there's some brilliant applications, right? The, the concept of monads the, and, and what it brought, especially the state moment, the, the way that you could do pure functional programming and, and whisk the state under, you know, under the carpet, um, which is a, a great contribution and a, and a brilliant insight. But it is also, again, fetish, fetish, fetishized, I guess. That's a bit of a tongue twister because people, you know, People have a very hard, because these things are so abstract, they have a very hard time explaining them. And uh, and they come up with all these, you know, all the funny analogs, the spacesuits, the astronauts. And it's basically, again, an attempt at a sort of kind of modularity. And, and you can basically implement it as an interface, as a pattern and be done, or you can wax poetic about all the mathematics behind it. And I think people there. There's a psychological and sociological element here that I, I don't necessarily want to speculate on, but it, it attracts a certain kind of mind. So uh, I, I could go many ways. Uh, one thing I would like to go towards is your life program, your environment, but I think we don't have time today to do it. So maybe I, sh I should invite you a, a second time, uh, and then instead I will. Uh, try to discuss what you said that it's about making things simpler and it's subjective. Are you aware of uh, of the there's a paper by I forgot his name right now, uh, 
pro pro about paradigms and the revolution in programming languages. What are your famous Lisper? Oh, I forget his name right now. Uh, I don't think it rings a bell uh, for okay. me. He, ri he writes notably that at, at the time, like he wrote it in the early 90s, I think, there had been a, a break between the programming language people and the systems people and the Lisp and small talkers were more thinking in terms of systems and interactions, whereas uh, the ML and other people were thinking in terms of programming language and a, a common and control system. And he said that these two communities were talking past each other because they had mutually incompatible paradigms. And so what was simple for one was extremely complex for the other and, and conversely. And uh, Mm, so that's an interesting, certainly there is that element. There are um, different different fundamental viewpoints and, and each has its, some strengths and weaknesses. Now, to a very small degree, uh, I think Newspeak is a step from a bit away from the pure small talk pro paradigm back into, into, lang into the more traditional uh, Form because it has advantages. So small talk is so radical that language describing it as a language is a misnomer because the the, the language only describes uh, uh, it only describes uh, things at the method level at object interactions. Uh, small talk does not have a syntax for classes at all, uh, and and all of that is basically a convention basically on on using a certain library and and certain message sense to compose reflectively of things and and so uh, this this is this is uh, a very different concept from the mainstream of programming language research and it has its power but it also has weaknesses uh there are the the problem of of inter program interchange has been has plagued the small talk community uh from day one because there really is no no good model for that. Uh, basically, the, the 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 small talk view is there's a sea of objects that are interacting. It so happens that there are some objects that are called classes, and they are capable of manufacturing these other objects called instances, which will then consult the class and behave in a certain way and so forth. But they're not a linguistic construct. And then you find, okay, if I have a sea of objects, um, this all works if there's only one universe. Uh, one, one C, but in practice, there are different people with different projects and they have each have their own little puddle of objects. And how do I take an object from one of these bodies of, of uh, water into another? And the problem is when you pull an object out, again, it's like the nuclear power plant. You keep uh, serializing the, you know, it's very hard to know when to stop and when to disconnect it. And in particular, the problem has been since a program is just this set of objects and not this linguistic construct, there's, there has been very difficult to separate them. And there's this horrible thing called file out format that was an improvisation once upon a time that lives on and is so ugly and 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 doesn't really work. So these things don't work with didn't work with conventional source control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Newspeak has a syntax, right? Uh, well, I'm not I haven't shown you it because. Most of the time you interact with the ID, but you can put it in a file with Emacs or, or whatever your favorite editor is, and it's a conventional syntax, and you put it in regular source control. So that's a relatively small but very important thing because that is a language, and then you can also attach a conventional formal semantics to it or whatever you want to do with it. And since it's so small, that's not very hard. Uh, so yeah, there there is certainly advantages to, to the linguistic viewpoint, and... Um, yeah, there is a uh, two worlds that do not talk to each other. The person I was thinking of was called Richard Gabriel, by the way. But is, is that... yeah, so, so that I, I that sounded a lot of like a lot of stuff that Dick Gabriel has written about, but that wasn't yes. that, that wasn't the name you mentioned, so it didn't uh, click for me. So I'm very familiar with Dick's writing. Yeah, whatever whatever the name is, but the gist of it I'm well aware of. Yeah. Thank you so much about that. Well, <laughs> would you like to add any last words? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, uh, nothing concentrates the mind like the prospect of an execution, last words and, and all that. But uh, uh, thank you for having me. That's all I, I have to say.
Well, I would love to have you again and this time discuss your life programming environment because we didn't have time to. Didn't even get there. Yeah, there's plenty to, to discuss. I mean, this all of this has been very high level and kind of not, not necessarily terribly concrete except the brief uh, screen share. Uh, so, yeah, we could do something, uh, something more concrete another time. And on a personal note, I'd love to hear your process, your intro, insights about business in general and the, the, the evolution of your own industry from this business perspective. Uh, yeah, well, business, if you want to go bankrupt, I can give you great advice on business. <laughs> Natural. Uh, but uh, in terms of the industry, yeah, I, we, we can chat uh, whenever, right? Uh, that's that's uh, you, you're interesting people, and I'm happy to... I've been talking to Francois for quite a quite a while on and off, and uh, happy to to discuss with you as well. Whenever, whenever I'm so you... grateful for you to, to to come and and let's do it again. I don't know another time. Should we? Come sure. Uh, you know, uh, this is when we, I'm sure you have a plan for your podcast and and you yes. want to vary it, whatever. But uh, tell me when. I'm I'm sure I can, I can uh, do that. We'll be happy then. Well, thank you so much, Gilad, and thank you so much, Fare. Everyone, this was Tech Talks from the Moon, our first episode. Stay tuned for more. Thanks, Gilad. Thanks, Fare. Thank you. Thank you so much.